Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending this seminar. This is a very special one for me. Um, our two guests are Leo McKee and uh, uh, Hugh Harvey. They're with Bright House in the UK. Uh, Leo has been coming or sending people from his company to our conference for a good many years now, and Leo comes every two or three years. We've become very good friends. Last June, Leo had uh, me and my wife over to the UK to visit with his management team and to tour their stores, to tour uh, their corporate office, and to learn more about how they do rent to own in the UK. I thought it'd be a wonderful opportunity for all of us to learn how our cousins, after all, rent to own in America actually came from the UK. And uh, it's only fitting that we, we uh, uh, see how it's developed differently from ours in the UK. They have a lot of interesting aspects of their business that uh, we either have done in the past or we've never done. And I thought it'd be great to have uh, them come and, and explain how the rent to own business is conducted in the UK. Uh, Hugh Harvey is going to start off. He's director of uh, uh, purchasing for Bright House. Hugh, thank you very much. And Leo, thank you for being here. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill. Good morning. And uh, thank you for attending the seminar this morning. Um, Leo, uh, the CEO of Bright House, and myself are delighted to be with you this morning at the invitation of APRO. Um, we are here on behalf of three and a half thousand colleagues who work for Bright House in the UK and approaching 300,000 customers, if not clients that we have literally up and down Scotland, England, and Wales. Um, let me quickly run into our operation. Uh, we have over 300 stores up and down the UK. Um, we started life just over two decades ago. We are going to talk to you this morning about really the last 10 years versus the whole 22 years, because the first portion of our life in the UK was really a carbon copy of the rent to own model here in the US. In the last 10 years, we've gone through transformational change, and that's where we believe you will drive some learnings from our model. We'll also focus on the future, how we intend to drive a BRICS business into a BRICS and CLICS business, and how do we intend to continue our growth. We have had continuous growth over the course of the last 10 years. A national player, our store size is relatively small at 2,000 square feet. We're on the high street. We're not out of town. On the high street because in the UK, in our towns, in our cities, in our villages, the high street still remains the social zone. It has access on foot and by public transport. Bear in mind, two-thirds of our customers do not have access to a car. So in town, on the high street, 312 stores up and down the country. National player with national centralized distribution and service credentials, much of which I will talk to in just a few moments. The sartorial elegance of Leo with Bill and Bill's wife Debbie in this, off, in this um, picture uh, represents payback for us because as Bill quite rightly said, he was very kind to attend the UK and to present at a management meeting that we had within our business. And he educated us as to the RTO model here in the US. Um, we now wish to come back and share with you and hopefully provide some learnings as to the RTO model in Europe. We are the single biggest RTO operator in Europe, um, so hopefully we can share some of our experiences to the benefit of your kind selves. Sartorial elegance on behalf of Leo myself, our uniforms, that is deliberate. Our colleagues, as I've mentioned, three and a half thousand of them, and circa 2,000 who are store-based, 
they wish to wear a tie and they wish to look professional in how they present themselves to our clients. Because fundamentally, often the single biggest purchase our clients will make will be with Bright House. And given the financial orientation of that dialogue, they wish to project themselves as professionals. So it's an attire that we wear when we visit our stores and when we work with our colleagues. As I say, payback time. I'm now going to introduce Leo, who's going to share with you Bright House UK. Leo. Thanks, Stu. This button here. Yeah. Correct. Just to get the technology right. OK. Hi, uh, I'll just uh, reiterate that um, I've been, I, when I first came to uh, Bright House, I was a rent to own Virgin. And uh, to tell you the truth, uh, I was quite a well known European retailer. And uh, when I was approached to, uh, as they put it, turn Bright House around, I'd never heard of Bright House, which amazed me because I thought I knew all major uh, players. And um, one of the uh, things that uh, I've learned in my previous life is learn from the best. Now, at one time, I was with the largest DIY business outside of the United States, which is called B&Q. And we formed an excellent relationship with Lowe's and Home Depot over many years. And we could do things like we could take a guy from B&Q and put the guy into um, and put the guy into Home Depot for six weeks. And he would learn, right? And they would do the reverse. So I've learned the advantage of learning from the best. It's interesting where we didn't practice that. I remember we were taking a B and Q into China, and the first B and Q store was in Shanghai, and we only had stores in the UK. And uh, parking is a big issue because these stores are out of town, and people come and they buy what they buy out of Home Depot here. You know, they buy paint and planks of wood and things like that. So we, we, we looked at getting a property in Shanghai, and we just couldn't get a property with enough car park space. So we said, OK, we'll buy one. It won't have enough car park space. And we equipped it. And there was a really two beautiful aisles on motor accessories in that store. Nobody in Shanghai used cars. They all came in bikes. And let me tell you, when you see a guy come pick up a fridge and go away in a bike, you're impressed. Hmm. And the, the motor accessories aisle, aisles became a place of rest, a place for contemplation. If in the busy rush of the day you wanted to go somewhere where you wouldn't be bothered, go to the motor accessories department in B&Q Shanghai, and nobody sells any motor accessories. So it's the importance of understanding your customer. Don't put your prejudices on it. Anyway, having learned this, uh, from a very early stage, um, I found that the best rent to own businesses in the world were in the United States. And so I looked up April on the website, and a name came out, Bill Keys was this name. And I came across here, and I have to say that uh, I've learned an amazing amount from the US rent to own businesses. I've learned the importance of family values. I've learned the importance of hard work. I've learned the importance of understanding your customers. And I've learned the importance of networking, uh, all from uh, April. So I'm your biggest, I promise you, overseas fan. I really believe in April, and it's a pleasure to be here. So let me just uh, start to tell you about this Bright House organization. We are the UK's leading rent to own retailer. There are really only two of any size. The other one is called Perfect Homes, and I know there's uh, an Aaron pres Aaron's presence in, uh, in this business. So um, I'm pleased to tell you we have a cordial relationship uh, with uh, uh, Perfect Homes, as we do, as we do with Aaron's. Um, 
I've just looked over the last five years for the purpose of this slide, and you can see that in terms of revenue, profit, stores, customers, and uh, the rest we've shown sustained growth, and indeed, if you look at the pattern over 10 years, it's the same. So a story of continuous growth is uh, the story of Bright House. Now this slide here, um, I want to explain to you, I didn't roll into Bright House and just have to uh, business as usual. It couldn't be business as usual because it was performing very poorly. And therefore, uh, I wrote the first five-year plan. So we have a five-year plan in Bright House. We call it a strategic business plan. And the first five-year plan said that um, we would quadruple the value of the business in five years. That's what it said. And five years later, it was quadrupled. And people said to me, you're a genius. How did you know this? Well, actually, at the time I came to Bright House, I was living in France. And I thought I was only going to be there for two years. And I thought some other poor sucker would be looking at it three years on and saying, did you see what he wrote five years ago? But no, I was there. And by luck, rather than judgment, we managed to get there. However, if you look at that, these are strategic programs. And uh, if I was in Renta Centre uh, uh, this week, and they have a strategy director right at the top of the business, and so do I. It's a, it's a good idea. So what does a strategy director do? I don't know. Do you? Um, you're very intelligent, I know. They told me. Um, so we develop a five-year strategy, take it back to a three-year plan, take it back to a one-year plan. We have a head of change management whose whole job is to make sure that every change program has clear goals, clear measures, clear milestones, is properly resourced, and is tied into the financial assumptions of the business. So I've got a, a, a guy, he's called head of change management, and that's what he does, right? Um, and just looking at this, this is a 10-year period, and I, I realized when I looked at this slide this morning, you can't see it very clearly from the back. However, I'll just talk you through it. So I came in uh, September 2005, and the very first strategic program was market analysis. So I paid an agency $200,000 to come in and look at the market and tell me what the market was. And what they said was, there's a huge market, it's a distinct proposition, it doesn't exist in the UK, it's been taken from the States, and you do it really badly. So, okay, so how do we do it really badly? Well, uh, your customers, as Hugh said earlier on, are buying your product to improve the quality of their lives. And as Hugh said, the most expensive purchase in their lives is not a car because most of them don't have cars. It's a sofa. And you're not presenting this in an asp aspirational way. But the other thing is, you're ripping them off. Uh, and they pointed out to me that we, for example, were selling an oven for £900. And you could buy the same oven on the high street for 450 So our cash price was... 900 retail, and then we build everything on it. And the, um, the, uh, the high street, you could buy it for 450. And we were paying the supplier 480 for it. Now, if you're the buyer and you're paying 480 and your cash price is 900, you're a hero, you're doing really well. But you're ripping off the customers. So the day I discovered that, I changed all product prices. So that oven went from 900 to 450, and I was paying 480 for it, okay? The buyers generally left the company <laughs> shortly thereafter. <laughs> well, it's true. Now, I have to tell you, they said rather unkind things about me to the suppliers. The kindest thing they said is, he's a lunatic, he doesn't know the industry, and he'll be gone in six months. That was the kindest thing. They said some bad, bad things as well. <laughs> okay. My mother would have been unhappy with them. Right? So anyway, um, so what I did was, I got every supplier in, 
and uh, I said, I've reduced your prices. I, I, my price is below what you are. Um, my price is below what you're, um, you're uh, charging me. And uh, I said to the supplier, if we don't do a, a deal today, uh, two things will happen. One, I will delist your product and two, I'll sue you, right? Um, so that's what we did. And uh, we managed to get new prices. Now, the other thing that I do in my business is I go for the best people I can. So I said to my HR guy, I want the best furniture and electrical buyer in the UK. So he found this guy, and this guy I worked for, he was a director of the equivalent of Circuit City, if you know that. So a chain with um, uh, 300 stores. So he came to talk to me, this guy, and his name was Hopper. So I said, good morning, Hopper, how are you? And I said, I'd like to offer you a job with Bright House, head of buying. So Hopper said to me, so how many, um, how many stores have you got? I said, 124. He said, we've got 300. How many employees have you got? I said, 1,100. He said, we've got 10,000. And he said, is it on the board of directors? And I said, no, you'd be too busy. And he said, it doesn't sound like a career move. So I said to him, how old are you? And he said, I'm 52. So I said, you're bored. You're bored. You're right, it's not a career move. It's an adventure. I said to him. Right, he said. Not really believing, you know, but he said. So he said, so what do you want me to do? I said, I want you to add 12 and a half million to the profit by better buying. 12 and a half million. And he said, well, why 12 and a half million? I said, because I'm going to sell this business in under two years, and I want to add 100 million to the value. So the value at this time was 70 million, right? So 12 and a half million, okay? Okay, he said, what else? I said, we've got 50 million in inventory, I want you to take it to 25 and give me better availability in the stores. Okay, he said, anything else? And I said, yeah, I want you to put together the best buying team in British furniture and electrical retailing. So he said, who's going to be the judge of that? I said, I am. He said, what's the appeal? I said, my wife. And you don't want to talk to her. <laughs> okay. So anyway, so he said, what's in it for me? So I said, well, uh, whatever you're paid in common, I will pay you. He said, you don't know what I'm paid. So I opened up my big baby blue eyes, and I looked at him very sweetly. And I said, I'll believe you, Peter. Just tell me. <laughs> so uh, he told me. I said, the second thing is, and at the time I was marking master's degrees, uh, and I said, working for me will be, David, you like this? Like doing a master's degree. I said to this 52-year-old guy, and he's like him, tough, mean, strong track record, and I said that to him. And you know, imagine, he goes, Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then I said, the third thing is, <clears throat> I'll give you a special bonus of one million pounds. One million pounds, if you deliver this. So he played his MBA game. He said, is it taxable? And I said, yes, it is. All right. So he came in. Well, I said, how long will it take you? He said, nine months. I said, I think it'll take you three years. It took him 18 months, and we sold the business for 170 million, it had been worth 70 million. And Hopper got his million, he was worth it, you know? And then he left to work in Russia. So the game is, don't horse about. Go for the best there is, right? So in terms of, the first thing I had to do in the first five year plan was to make this a commercial business, right? And that's what I had to do. So when you look at the strategic programs, you see, Market analysis, understanding the market and the customer. <clears throat> Product ranging and pricing, and sourcing rather. Competitive pricing. Went into national TV advertising for the first time. Um, top team realignment. It's very, very important to, uh, that your top team buy in. So, in the, bit, in the nature of the business I run, which is private equity, 
it is normally usual that the CEO and the CFO have shares in the business. In my business, it's the top 20 guys. They're all shareholders. We have a monthly shareholders meeting. They buy in. And uh, one of the things that was, uh, I was in Bestway on Monday, and I've learned a few things about how they incentivize their staff, and it's very impressive, I have to say. Um, so the first five years, or the first two and a half years, were about making it commercial. Then the next strategic program is accelerated store rollout. So go, go from 124, and we've now got 310. Financial planning, make sure that every store manager is profit accountable and knows how to do it. And then finally, management development and succession planning. Make sure we're bringing people through. These were all strategic programs. The head of change management, responsible for making sure they run, and a senior executive responsible for each program. Um, and then we move to the next five-year phase. So we called the first five years uh, turnaround, right? Make it a commercial business. We've called the second five years transformation because what was happening was that the business was starting to outstrip its infrastructure. And the infrastructure was very similar to the way rent to own operates in the US. In other words, everything is done from the store. I went into, uh, I went into uh, 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 an RAC store on uh, Saturday afternoon. Uh, just dressed down, set low, and so on. And I was really impressed with the fact that a customer can come in at 10 in the morning at 4 o'clock in the afternoon and has got their sofa. That is impressive, right? Uh, and uh, I was also impressed, I have to say, with the RAC store manager as well, who certainly knew what he was doing. In our business, we've educated the customers not to expect that sofa for seven days. Because it's really important to us that the sales floor remains a place of magic. And therefore, we don't want to take product off the sales floor. We want the customer to walk into this emporium and imagine that they're in a really classy home. And therefore, we have set up a national distribution center, a national engineering center. No product is fixed in the stores. No product is delivered from the stores, right? So you've got the national center in the center of the country and local centers. So we separated it out. And of course, we had a strategic program on that. Um, and then uh, we, uh, so that's supply chain. Credit and collections, <clears throat> that's another toughie. So what we've done there is uh, we have regulation in the UK now, and I'll talk about that more later. But we have set up a 150-person call centre, which is 100 FTE, and we took 400 jobs out of the stores. Right? So we took the account rep job out of the stores, and uh, now we took 400 jobs out of the stores with no redundancies. Right? We redeployed the people, okay? Yeah, there was some natural turnover, but no redundancies. So now, in the UK, if the customer runs late, the first phone call is from the call center. For the first three days thereafter, it's the store. Um, investment in multi-channel. The customer in the UK is very, very internet aware. In fact, they are, if you look at international stats, they're, they're in the lead in, that, in that, that area. And therefore, it's very important that we offer a true multi-channel option. And he will be talking more about that later. And then customer focus and compliance means how the hell do you cope with all this regulatory important stuff, he said, being recorded, um, and uh, run a commercial business. And then ERP is, uh, a, is a, an IT platform, one platform, one truth, uh, everything ties into it. So I've taken time in this, I'll take, I'll take less time in the other slides, but in this decade of growth and change, we've been running a twin track philosophy. One is to drive a business in the way you would expect us to, and the second is to put in major, major change programs that operate to military-like disciplines. That's the way they operate. 
And indeed, I, I go and talk to the UK military from time to time. I was there three or four weeks ago just talking about leadership and how, but the same for the American military. What's happened with the UK military, if you take the guys at the top, they've got three issues to deal with. The first is, 30 years ago, if you were a, a general, the most tricky technical job reporting to you was a quartermaster. Now you've got a guy that deals with computers and you don't know anything about computers and he reports to you. What do we do about that? They can't just call in somebody like Ellison Crider, just to, you know, like that. So they've got to deal with it. Secondly, the UK forces are more multicultural than they were. I mean, when, when, when I was a child, you had Scottish regiments. The only people in, that, in these regiments were Scottish. They all walked about in kilts. Right, well, you don't have that anymore. You've got a multicultural environment. And then thirdly, even in the armed forces, <clears throat> individuals are more prone to question orders than they were 10 years ago. So that's a cultural change. So I was talking to the armed forces about this. What do I learn from them? The discipline of change management projects. All this slide says is there are multiple contact points for the customer. Um, you know, payment, supply chain, driver at their door, in store, on the net, looking at the product. It must be seamless. It's got to be the same. This one you can't read, so I won't explain it to you. But basically, basically what it says, I stood at the back of the hall this morning and thought, I can't read this. Okay? Well, fundamentally, it says what I said to you. You know, and that is, these are structured train change programs. That one at the bottom says head of change management. And they look through a matrix of customer commercial compliance. Right? They must satisfy all three criteria. Okay? Four pillars of success. Understand the market. Secondly, have a clear proposition. We have learned from your websites on how to communicate your, your proposition. You've been doing it for years, right? We have um, shamelessly stolen your ideas and put them in the UK. <laughs> so uh, reputation management is very important. And again, we've learned from you on that. Edwin, Bill Keese, and others. I'll talk about that. And sharing best practice, I've already talked about. And I'll talk more about that. In terms of who we are, <clears throat> it's very interesting. When you look at the UK market, it's a large addressable market. Despite economic fluctuation, it's been pretty stable. We reckon that in our uh, um, impaired credit group, uh, there are 13 million adults and 15 million elsewhere. And it stays the same. In recession, out of recession, it stays largely the same. And of course, we are an alternative option to pawnbrokers, payday loans, home collections credit. Our guys don't really get car finance or guarantor loans. That's the market that we're in. Here's a, here are our customers. You can read it. Um, but um, two thirds have below average income. And 90% of them live in rented accommodation, so they don't have mortgages to pay. Um, uh, we invest very substantially in knowing our customers. So, for example, every month, 500 Bright House customers are interviewed by an external marketing agency on a randomized selection, and they give us feedback. And it's amazing what, what, what this tells you. The other thing is the directors of the business go around the stores. We have mystery shoppers. We frequently work in the store on a Saturday ourselves. <clears throat> and it's very interesting when you're face to face with the customers. By the way, <laughs> when I was in the rent, rent a center store uh, on Saturday, and I was talking to the manager, and I said, I'm very keen to understand uh, you know, just what people do. He said, do you want to come out and do a delivery with me? I said, uh, no, thank you. I'm kind of, kind of pushed for time. <laughs> it was good. Here are customers. There's one, Karen. Uh, she's a customer for a couple of years. Uh, she's part of a low-income household. And over a period of time, she'll buy everything. She'll buy a sofa, she'll buy a television, she'll buy a mobile phone, etc., etc. Whereas Mike, Mike's uh, 
young, single, and uh, he's into technology. So as it says there, Karen's about a third of her customers and Mike's about 15% of her customers. And when you're looking at debt, Mike is more prone to miss his payments than Karen is. You'll be surprised to know. Okay. In the UK, it's very interesting. <clears throat> what we're seeing is that uh, we're seeing a widening, a widening discrepancy between what we might call the haves and the have-nots. The UK population is 63, 64 million. 20 million of them live in the southeast, the greater London area. And that is prosperous. That is very prosperous. House prices are very, very high. It's almost impossible for a police officer to buy a house in London. You know, the lowest priced houses are about $100,000. So it's difficult even for a police officer. And the political landscape has moved to the right. The, the Conservative government is attacking welfare benefits. Uh, they are saying that excessive welfare benefits encourage people not to work. And uh, whereas the Labour Party, they say, no, you've got to give more benefits. So there are benefit cuts around, and that, of course, affects our demographic. And again, it's very important to understand that, look at it. The UK has just introduced a national minimum wage uh, where the lowest you can pay somebody per hour has jumped to just under $10, right? Retailing doesn't like that, okay? So, it's jumped. so we ourselves, we pay ahead of the market. We were paying about uh, $9 for the lowest job. We had to push that up by a dollar. Um, so that's what's happening. And the regulatory environment is unbelievable. Uh, I anticipated this regulatory environment about four years ago. I appointed onto my board an individual called the Chief Risk Officer, right? And the chairman said to me, listen, he said, this regulatory regime will be your worst nightmare. So I looked at him and I said, look, Richard, my worst nightmare is one of my children being in a car crash and rendered par uh, qu quadriplegic. That's nothing to me. You may have been right. <laughs> it is a nightmare, you know. And you have to address it with urgency. And I'll talk about that. Learned a lot from you guys on that as well, how to deal with the regulators. Explaining a proposition, I'm not going to spend any time in this because I stole all of this from your websites so you'll recognize everything in it. Uh, there's a little test later on uh, where you will tell me the one I took from your company. <laughs> okay? But it's what you would expect. Okay? Reputation management is really important. If you look at this, the Financial Times is the heaviest weight uh, uh, newspaper in Britain. And this is one article, Leo McKee, Bright House CEO, unrepentant about rent to own, it says. And it says, the controversial UK store chain. And I know you have this in the States as well. People who don't understand their business, don't understand their market, have got strong views and articulate them. And we have to deal with that. Um, and the face of Bright House in the UK is myself. You've probably gathered I am a modest, unassuming sort of guy. And I have to appear on television from time to time, but my mother likes it. Okay. <laughs> this is the message we put across. We are an unabashed, an unabashed champion of rent to own. I look at your guys and the passion you have for rent to own. It comes across again and again, and we do the same. It's appreciated by our customers. I've already said to you, we do um, constant customer research. And it's quite interesting. The customer sometimes, it tends to be the, the heavyweight financial media. And if the customers ever see anything, they tend to get annoyed. Do they think we are stupid? You know, so, so in some ways it helps our sales. But um, it, it's unhelpful. We run an ethical business. We have a clear vision. We strive to add value to people's lives every day. And in order to do that, we seek to be a good employer. We seek to be proactive in the community. Uh, three weeks ago in the London Marathon, I waved to 18 Bright House runners, 18 who participated in that marathon and raised 60,000 pounds for a national child charity. 
Uh, we have guaranteed 60,000, so we will match fund whatever they raise. So if they raise 20, if they raise 30, we'll put in 30. If they raise 40, we'll put in 40. If they raise 20, we'll take it up to 60. So we seek to be responsible corporate citizens and good employers. And uh, as it says there, we've got a successful business. It's very important that we engage the opinion formers. And indeed, when Bill Keyes came over, um, last uh, June, uh, he and Edwin have been invaluable with their advice, I have to say. Um, they, uh, they have helped us greatly in terms of how you manage the regulators. That's a photograph of the British Prime Minister. But the Money Advice Trust and the National Debt Line are two not-for-profit organisations that if the politicians or the media uh, want to know something about the... Uh, rent to own market or the credit market, they ask them as impartial judges of that. Now, when I first came to Bright House, both these organizations were enemies of Bright House. They are now advocates. So the Money Advice Trust, National Debt Line, and the Money Charity are advocates. And then the major trade organization for retail in Britain is the British Retail Association, consortium rather, and we're members of that. And of course, we focus on the main media and we focus on the, the politicians. In terms of our people, um, said it here, uh, I like nothing better than seeing someone who started as a driver either stay as a driver for 50 years and do a great job and enjoy it with his family or progress through the organization. They are of equal value as far as I'm concerned. Indeed, last year at our conference, I presented an award to uh, <clears throat> an engineer who'd done 50 years with us. 50 years, what do you think of that? That's a lot, isn't it? You know, 50 years, he's 67. I gave him a 50-year 50, 50 award, I couldn't believe it. Um, so, uh, high professionals. Now, again, one of the things that uh, uh, I've done is I've gone out and uh, I had the advantage of not growing up with a business. So when I was transforming the business, I went out for high marketing professionals, high finance professionals, high IT professionals, right? Um, and, and I've gone for the best I can in Britain. And uh, so therefore, when you look at my board and my team, I've got to watch that my team don't get poached because none of them are from a rent to own background. So how do I make, keep it pure? In terms of operations, I promote from within. So all the top guys in operations have all worked in stores and so on and so forth, right? But if you take Hugh Harvey, for example, he's my buying director, right? Um, he does not have a rent to own background, but he's shit a lot in buying, right? And he knows how to buy product and he knows how to market product. We seek to be an employer of choice. In other words, why would you want to leave Bright House? So one of the KPIs for our store managers is labor turnover and labor ret retention. If you're a store manager, Chad, and if you lose three people in the course of a year, we want to talk to you. Chad, what are you doing wrong here? Right? Because we do a lot of research in that. And someone once said that people join a company and leave a boss. And it's interesting, if you look at our 310 stores, the best stores, I've got 51 stores that over a year, nobody has left. Zero labor turnover. Now, Chad, what does that tell you about these stores? Sorry? Fun to work for. Fun to work for, that's exactly right. And whereas, if you've got a store that's lost six people during the year, look at the store manager, right? It's not fun to work for. So labor turnover and labor retention is really key, and we take it seriously. And by the way, is David Kramer here today? He's not. Uh, I learned a lot from David Kramer. I went there last year. And he's got a practice where um, his HR person, if a new hire starts, she gets, she gets a phone call in week one, week five, week nine, and week 13 from the HR director. And it's really good. And we've put that into our business, right? And it really works. And therefore, when I came, I came to this convention, I wanted to A, see David Kramer again, 
and visit one of his stores. So I went to one of his stores without telling him where I was going, right? And the manager's name was Rosie Del Rio, okay? So, and I speak Spanish, so I spoke to Rosie Del Rio in Spanish. Now, I know to you I look Mexican, but she didn't think I was Mexican, mm. okay? <laughs> but she was surprised, okay? But it was a really good conversation, and I'll tell you something, I was in that store for an hour, and at the end of the hour I said to Rosie, Rosie and her team, is there anything you'd like to ask me? And Rosie said, tell me three things you would do differently in this store. And I thought, hey, good on you. You know, good girl. You know, what I, you know, both she was up for it. And that's what we want. And David Kramer and his team have done a great job in terms of engaging their staff. I see it from going to their stores. <clears throat> in terms of our field management, the way we run it, I, we used to run it pretty classically. So you had a store manager, we call it regional manager, some people call it district managers, and a divisional manager. We've put a twist on it. We've got here, as you can see, um, three divisions. So we've, we've got, um, we have 310 stores. So if you look at the divisional director south, there's a divisional director central and a divisional director north, right? And so the guy in the south, he's got, si he's got seven regional managers. So each regional manager's got roughly a, uh, 15 stores. But he also has a SWAT team. He's got a customer development manager who is, in effect, the deputy divisional director and a very commercial guy. He's got an HR business partner and he's got a finance business partner. So he's got a SWAT team. So I'm keeping the accounting close to the stores the people stuff close to the stores. And then we've got a centralized logistics and engineering division, it reports to the operations director, and you can see we've got a national distribution center, national engineering center, and 14 local distribution centers. And Hugh will speak a little more about that. In terms of sharing best practice, um, as I said to you, I strongly, strongly believe in it. And I was just looking at, before I came, Who's on the Leo Roll of Honor, right? And, you know, I've been to us in Texas two or three times, beautiful town, and also hosts APRO. So I have to say that Bill Keese and his nine-person team, I know you're proud of them, and so you should be. They are a class act, as I would say. And Shelley Martinek, there's no chance of me not running this workshop today badly. She's been all over me, <laughs> right? Shelley Martinek. And just when I thought it was okay, Richard May came in and said, how are you doing? You got it going well. Okay, so they're on the case. I listened last night to the superlatives being spoken about Ed Wynn, and he's a class act, and I'll be at his conference this afternoon, his meeting. So guys like him, in, uh, I've already mentioned David Kramer, and Teresa from Bestway. Um, buddies, last year, I sent two guys to the conference last year, and uh, they spent two days in Tampa, Florida, with uh, buddies, uh, Jamie Slatton and Joe Gazzo, and they learned a lot. And then, in terms of, I've spent a lot of time with Renta Center, and uh, I was looking at supply chain efficiency, but there are people not on there that it would be right to mention. So. And Aaron's, you know, Ken Butler, what a guy, what a guy. I took Ken Butler to the oldest pub in England. And I said to him, now Ken, this pub sells about 30 beers. I said, there's a beer in here, you mustn't drink it. It's called Old Peculiar, and you'll get drunk. And he said, well, what are you drinking, Leo? And I said, well, I'm used to it. I've been acclimatized, I'm Scottish. I'll try it anyway. Eight pints later, he said, how are you feeling, Leo? And I said, I'm starting to feel a bit woozy, Ken. Who are you? He said, I haven't tried your whiskey yet. Oh, Christ, okay. <laughs> so Ken Butler, I've, I've had good relationships with uh, Aaron's. Charlie Loudermilk, what a guy, retired now, as you know. Uh, Greg Tanner, the wisdom of the Tannerisms, what a guy he is. In terms of high touch, I was talking to uh, 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 Wayne Chambers and his team uh, yesterday. And I also talked to the Maverick, the Renegade, who's jumped out of there, no loyalty. And let me name him and shame him. His name is Ellison Crider. And he's sitting over there. 
And then there are two other non-American organizations up there. One is Easy Home in Canada. The boss of that is David Ingram. I am very, very old, and 30 years ago he worked for me. So good in there. And in Thorn, in Australia, there's James Marshall. So, and I've just tried to capture what I picked up from each. It's much more than this. But uh, Bill Keys, April, Edwin, you know, using the customer as an advocate, encouraging the customer to be an advocate. I never thought of that. We're now doing that. In terms of uh, best way, colleague buy-in, the phone call uh, in week one, week five, week nine, and week 13. In terms of buddies, these guys are so commercial. You know, when you go on the sales floor, the guys are really up for customer service. Easy home, they've moved into other areas, branch stretch, more about that later. Uh, rent a center, we'll, we, I sent my logistics guys there to look at how they do their supply chain. Big challenges for them, big challenges for us. And then uh, Easy Home, oh sorry, Thorn in Australia. <clears throat> you saw that I mentioned uh, I have a head of change management. <laughs> They've done a lot of change and I've learned a few things from that and put it into my business. So just as I have sought to learn and share best practice, so April does here in the US anyway. And it's a great thing to be here. Back to you. Right, thank you, Leo. Uh, as Leo was taking you through our business and our strategy, I wish to take you through a little bit more nitty gritty detail of our marketing, our merchandising, uh, just to give uh, a little bit of insight. Um, a key platform within our business is our seasonal catalog. Um, many of you have them in front of you. It's a 140 page catalog. We print about 1.5 million catalogs each and every year. Um, we do it in the spring and the autumn winter with supplementary catalogs covering the quieter summer months and our most important, what we term peak trading Christmas months, November, December. I'll focus a little bit more on this particular catalog. Um, 140 pages. Uh, it, it covers our core categories of furniture, domestic appliances, technology, and televisions. Um, we make money out of the catalog before we put it into the hands of our customers because of the supplier support that we have from, from printing the catalog. We distribute the catalog 200,000 this spring via our stores. That takes a period of four to six weeks. We also send 100,000 of our catalogs to, um, directly to customers who are less frequent visitors to our stores. They typically take advantage of our easy pay mode and pay via a debit card. So we send the catalog to them via the mail. This spring, we've also sent 100,000 catalogs to prospective clients. So through a sophisticated targeting technique, hopefully that will drive new clients, new customers into our business. We've reduced the size of the client to keep it relevant. We've gone to a magazine format, some would say a handbag type format, uh, and in doing so, we've changed the weight of the paper. We've reduced the unit cost by 20% to allow for that mailing. The unit cost of this is 46 cents. In terms of uh, ranging, as Leo's mentioned, our ranging tends to be aspirational. Most people outside of the industry would think of us leading with opening price point merchandise. That is not the case. Our customers are very brand aware. They want the latest products from the latest brands and the best designs. So a few examples. Our washing category, our best-selling washer over the last 12 months has been a Wi-Fi enabled washing machine with an app on one phone. If you want to whitewash, you put it into your phone and your washing machine automatically kicks into a whitewash. That product has been challenged by a product that I believe is marketed here in the US from Samsung, which is AdWash. AdWash is not a low cost product, it's at the high end. That is now outselling a Wi-Fi product. So it's not the basic seven kilogram drum washer that we sell, 
its high end. If I take technology, technology has driven our business over the last 18 months with phenomenal growth. And in technology, it's about Apple and Samsung mobile phones. There is no mid-market in technology. You either go for the brand leaders or you cover the basis with an opening price point offer. Uh, we look to extend from our traditional product range, domestic appliances. We're just about to embark on a test on built-in cooking, a new category, but there's growth to be had from our existing destination categories. However, through listening to our customers, we found that we are underserving their gifting requirements. So last year, we pulled together 20 listings to focus on gifting. We shortened our term. In the back of the catalog, you'll see our prices and our term. In our destination categories, our term tends to be three years, 156 weeks. We went to the market and gave a term of 26 weeks, six months. And that proved to be tremendously successful, which we'll repeat again this year. We also look at gaming as a big opportunity for us. Leo and myself took part in a demonstration of VR. We lead in high-end gaming in the UK. Our customers have time, they are time rich. So gaming platforms, high-end gaming platforms, we succeed on. In actual fact, with ASUS, a key manufacturer out of the Far East, we are their number two retailer of high-end gaming systems. Their number one retailer is Walmart here in the US. We look forward to VR coming into our business because we see it as a phenomenal opportunity. But it's not all about sex and appeal and technology. We also listened to our customers as we did for Christmas gifting, and we looked at them and said, we're not servicing the baby and toddler market. So in stores today, we have trials of push chairs and carry cots, again on that shortened term of six months to a year in order to facilitate that product category. If I look at what we're trying to portray in stores, we try to portray with the latest product, but we also try to embrace the latest technology. So we try to convey and provide our people with uh, iPads and tablets so that they can engage with conversation with our customers, not using the catalog, which is used in home. In stores, we're using technology in order to convey you know, vibrancy and relevance and modernity to them. Uh, we use it also to remove any complication from our business, to simplify our processes, making us more efficient, and ideally moving to a paperless environment. And we use it to get feedback from our customers. We're just about to embrace an online feedback in terms of how they give us and critique our business and our service. In stores, we try to create an environment that is aspirational, the likes of which we put in our catalogs, and we allow ourselves to use some quirky language in terms of how we portray ourselves. Referrals, customer refer referrals, contribute over half of our new businesses, and we try to do it with a tone of voice, which is a little bit cheeky, a little bit warm, in keeping with our brand. Going forward, as Leo has mentioned, the future is about bringing the component parts. The last decade has been one-to-one, face-to-face -to -face relationships in stores. Stores will always be our key platform going forward, but it's critical that we drive the experience across a full spectrum of customer touch points. And this is the emphasis that we have today, defining the deliberate customer journey as to what should they expect when they visit the store, versus what should they expect when they go online. And in terms of online, we will have a fully transactional website up and running at the start of next year. That presents some challenges to us, but it, it presents some fantastic opportunity. And we see it as a major platform for growth, whereby our brand will appeal to a whole new sector of our audiences. And it gives us the opportunity to drive efficiencies through our business such that we will become even more cost effective in what we do. It's not all, not all about new sexy stuff. We, like you, have to deal with the returns within the rent to own business model. However, we're trying to apply the same skills that we do on new to old. We have 
national engineering centre that refurbished the product. We're literally in weeks' time going to relaunch a new branding campaign. We're calling what you call pre-loved. We're calling it refreshed with a complete new campaign to the point whereby the engineer who refreshes a product, we're looking to them to sign a piece of paper to be part of the passport that goes with that product to say, I am proud to have refreshed your product so that it can sit in your home. So innovation to some of the less sexy aspects to our business. So the future. The last decade has been real heavy investments at the front end. Because we go online, and you can envisage in the future, in two years' time, whereby the first face-to-face -face interaction our customers might have will be with a delivery driver, then it's in this area that we're investing and improving our serving credentials and working with our delivery people because they will leave the final view, the final experience with our customers. Engaging them, deliberate, deliberately defining the process and the interaction that we expect from them, and we're doing the same with our engineering service. A little bit more detail, which I'll now pass back to Leo, with respect to just, just final on, aspects on compliance. Just, just on this, uh, this slide, guys, um, due to all the bank traumas, the regulatory and the environment in the UK has become massively intrusive. We've got two things to do. One is to respond to the regulatory impositions in a way that doesn't disadvantage the customer and of which is commercial. That's the first thing. Secondly, and in some ways more important, we must influence the regulator, right? Because if the regulator is allowed to go in untrammeled, then the, you no longer have a business. It's, it's a bureaucracy. And we must address that robustly. And we're doing these two things. And then finally, in our, in our current, last slide here, please, in our current uh, five-year plan, the, uh, we also look ahead. And we've learned from the US and indeed from Canada and Australia that there are other things we can do. So the Bright House brand name is a powerful one. And we are looking over the next five years at short-term loans, at secured loans, at credit cards. Overseas expansion, if it comes, would be in Europe. And also uh, what uh, uh, Aaron's call progressive and rent -a center call uh, acceptance now. Yeah, uh, we are also looking at that. So that's our presentation, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you found it. Um, interesting and relevant. We will be about for the, the rest of the morning if anyone wants to approach us. If there, are, if there are any quick questions, happy to take them now. Or have we done it so well you don't have... Yeah, it's weekly, yeah. We have a strong part-time uh, 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 Base, but fundamentally, you have a manager who tends to focus on debt, uh, a deputy manager who focuses on sales, sales associates, and an account rep, backed by a call centre. More than 50%. Yeah. Where do you sell your refreshed products? Where do we sell it? Out of our stores. In our stores, yeah. Yeah, we sell the refresh product. And the point is there that if the customer comes in on a Saturday and picks that sofa, he's not getting it for a week because we want to keep the store intact. A tax advantage. Tax advantage? No, no, there's no tax advantage. No, I don't think so. Okay. Yes. No, well, you've got a, you've been in the rent to own business for sixty years. I mean, rent to own is new to the UK, and uh, the Bright House brand, as I said, when I took this job, I never heard of Bright House. You know, and in fact, one of the things we've struggled with, the customer research told us, we're opening new stores, we're going to a town, we put up, put it up, they don't know what rent to own is, so we've had to make sure we communicate what rent to own is clearly and uh, succinctly in a clear, crisp fashion.
what, what happens is the, the call centre uh, has 150 people. They get it when they're one day late, they get it. So for the first three days, it's the call centre that deals with them, right? Now, the advantage of that, particularly in a regulated environment, is consistency, right? And thereafter, the store follows up. Sorry? Say again. What, what affects it is the, uh, the, the, the uh, duration of the rental period. So technology tends to be 18 months, sofas are three years. Um, but otherwise, there's a consistency to it. Uh, we'll look at what the market will bear. We don't think that way. We'll look at what the market, we want to be competitive in the market. So our base price uh, uh, is, uh, if you walked in and you bought a, 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 a fridge cash from me, you would pay the same price as you would in Circuit City. Right? We'll look at the market. It's a market thing. And we look at the market every week. Oh, we create space for it. Uh, we, yeah, we put it next to it. We don't have a separate uh, uh, refresh area. We use a different colour of price ticket only. And of course, uh, David, uh, what we do is, we, uh, if, if that sofa sells to you, it's got to come off the floor and that space be filled by something else. Who's operating this um, uh, Microsoft. No, no, we don't. It's, uh, I'm sure that Ellison Crider would have a view of that. You know, we did come across and talk to him about it. Um, you know, we could be a bit smarter. Whoever come to the US, we'll be talking to him. <laughs> okay, well, listen, thank you very much for your questions. Uh, we hope you found it stimulating. We are delighted, as you said, to have the opportunity of feedback to Americans. It does occur to me that when the Pilgrim Fathers came, they came from England, right? <laughs> we have taken rent to own, back from the US. Thank you. <laughs>